Well, I want to thank Beth, Betsy, and David, all the elders, for uh, both their words and prayers today. And more than that, the burden that they carry in caring for our church is a noble thing to care for a church, and we owe them so much. And this has been a hard season for so many parents and volunteers and staff and so many folks in our congregation. And so I'm very grateful for the elders to have this opportunity uh, to address all of you today. Um, I hope that this can mark uh, the end of one season that has been really painful and be the beginning of a whole new era for a church that God has loved and watched over and blessed for so many years. This is not going to be a typical farewell talk uh, because it is such an unusual and painful season. And a lot of the logistics and next steps and details are included in the elders' letter, so I don't need to go into that. But it is a really good thing to acknowledge that there is hurt and to invite God in it because that's so often the place where we meet Jesus more deeply than any place else. I've had some people ask, Uh, Am I going to talk in this message about what I'm learning? And that's a really good question. But to tell the truth, uh, this has been such a raw experience and it is still so fresh and there's still so much stuff to process that I don't have anything like a a clarity or well-ordered sequence of lessons learned. I believe that will come someday and I will look forward a lot to sharing it when that day comes, but not today. I do want to tell you one thought that's been a very helpful one for me in this season, and it is that life is not a problem to be solved. It is a story to be lived. And I'm in the middle of my story, and I have no idea how it will end. But I know a real important part of the story is saying goodbye. To say goodbye well, thoughtfully, honestly, from the heart, with love, It's very important in honoring relationships. So that's what I want to do today. When Nancy and I lived in Chicago, we had a friend who hated to say goodbye. And he would sometimes just get up and walk out of a room. And we had no idea where's he going to go. Is he leaving the house? What's happening? And so this little word goodbye is a little signal to say, I'm not abandoning you. I'm not deserting you. I will mourn our absence, even if it's quite brief. My body may be gone, but the love remains. And that sound you hear is me cheering you on from the corner. So uh, it's a real good thing to say goodbye. And I thought about the Bible. And what does the Bible have to say about goodbye? What's a theology of goodbye like? And, And then it occurred to me, I never thought about this before, the word goodbye is not actually in the Bible. You go from Genesis to Revelation, from Adam all the way through the Apostle Paul, nobody ever says goodbye. And there's actually a really good reason for that. The Oxford English Dictionary says that we got the word goodbye. It kind of evolved in about the 16th century as a contraction from the phrase, God be with ye, God be with you. For centuries before that, when people were departing, they didn't just say, I'm leaving. It wasn't just information. It was a prayer. It was a heartfelt wish. It was a benediction. It was an invocation. While I cannot be with you, may God be with you. Uh, About 150 years ago, there was a hymn writer, Jeremy Rankin, and when he learned that that was the origin of the word goodbye, he actually wrote a hymn, old, old hymn, called God Be With You Till We Meet Again. By his counsel's guide uphold you, with his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. He wrote it so that every week in that little church, when people would leave of a Sunday, they could sing those words over each other. And it was so powerful that uh, when World War I came, they would put those words on a postcard and send them with soldiers when they would have to travel overseas to face battle and death. God be with you. So I was thinking a real good text for us, for this message, is the way that Paul ended his church, his letter to the church at Thessalonica, when he says, Now may the Lord of peace give you peace at all times, in every way. 
the Lord be with you. It's not goodbye. It's God be with you. And I wanted to tell you how you have been with me in very good, preordained, predestined Presbyterian fashion. You were God with me before I even knew any of you, before I even knew that there was a Menlo Church. When I was going through Fuller Seminary and Nancy and I were engaged to be married, I got a phone call and I was told that I was being offered a fellowship so that after we got married, Nancy and I could go to Aberdeen, Scotland, and I would get to study the New Testament and theology over there. And I told Nancy about that and my kind of slow, methodical way. I was saying, we'll have to think about this. We'll have to weigh the pros and cons. And Nancy was nodding her head, but she was packing because she already knew that we were going to go. And we did. And it changed our lives, changed our marriage. And I love that what I love so much about our church, uh, the generosity and the uh, global vision and the love of education and life of the mind and uh, to have a thoughtful faith, theological reflection, an expanded view of humanity, caring about cultures, this kind of restless desire for a new experience was shaping me from you before I knew that you even existed. You changed me before you even met me. And then we came here to Menlo and I joined our staff. And I remember about that first year, I was at a restaurant called Amici's having lunch with one of our elders named Larry Langdon. And Larry said, John, I think we ought to pull together a group of people from our church and pray and ask God, God, what do you want from our church? What do you have for us? Because God has blessed our church way too much for us just to soak it all in ourselves. And I would never have thought of that, but it was a great idea. And so we did, and we spent the better part of a year studying and praying and listening and discerning. And out of that came this dream. What if we were able to launch new campuses like little outposts of God love all around the Bay Area? And then came Cafe, and then San Mateo, and then Mountain View, and then San Jose, and then Saratoga, and then South City, and then who knows wherever else. And, and groups of people that had more faith and vision and servanthood and generosity and perseverance than I could ever have imagined. So... I'm here for these few moments, not to say goodbye, but to say, God be with you. And I want to do that because uh, I am learning. One thing that I am learning is, if God is with you, nothing else really matters. And if God is not with you, nothing else really matters either. I will tell you... Uh, one more Dallas Willard quote. Anybody want to hear one more Dallas Willard quote, whether you want to or not? Dallas said that sometimes he would talk with people uh, who were puzzled or disappointed with how their life turned out. And it made them wonder, did they do something wrong? Or maybe was God not really faithful to them? Or it might be people who were aging and thought that they didn't have a future anymore. And Dallas said, the fact that their earthly, fleshly existence was coming to an end was really not very significant. He said, what is of great significance is the person you have become. And then here's the line. Circumstances and other people are not in control of an individual's character or the life that lies endlessly before them in the kingdom of God. Circumstances and other people are not in control of your character, the person you become, or the life that death itself cannot stop that lies endlessly before you. There is nothing at ultimate risk in circumstances. They don't determine your life. Dallas used to ask sometimes, how are you doing? And one time I said, when it was a difficult time, okay, under the circumstances. And he said, well, what are you doing under there? You are not meant to live under the circumstances. You are meant to live under the wing of our Heavenly Father. You are meant to live under the care of God. You are meant to live under those arms that have lost none of their power and strength, under the watchful gaze that sees every sparrow that falls from a tree, under, under the magnificent compassion of the one who made you. And uh, our teacher in this, of course, is Jesus. When Jesus was leaving his disciples for the final time. He did not tell them goodbye. We're told in the Gospel of Matthew 
the very last words in Matthew, they're all gathered together, and he gives them this magnificent charge, which now comes to you. Go, therefore, because all authority in heaven and earth is given to me, go uh, into all the world and make disciples, apprentices, students of Jesus, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to do everything whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. I am not abandoning you. I am not deserting you. While we'll be uh, separated from a little while, my body will go, but my love remains. And that sound you hear will be me cheering you on from heaven. There is no situation in which Jesus will not be present if you want him there if you invite him in. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I will, I will fear no evil because you are with me. For life is not a problem to be solved. It is a story to be lived. And so we don't say goodbye. We say, God be with you. Uh, A couple of people have asked me, what are you going to do next? And I have no idea. Uh, My story will unfold. Really, all of ours do. But I do have a conviction. And my conviction is real good news for all of us. And it is that God never wastes a hurt. God brings real good out of stuff that looks real bad. God redeems suffering. And that is why there is a cross of a Savior who died for our sins in the middle of the great story. Because what looked like it was the end of his story was really the beginning of a much greater story. What looked like the worst thing was really the best thing. What looked like the saddest goodbye in the world was actually two days later the most joyful hello in human history. And that means that God has real good things in store now for you. Wherever you've been, whatever you have experienced, whatever loss, whatever hurt, God will not waste it. And that means that God has real good things in store for this church, for Menlo Church, even after a difficult season. So I just want to say, God be with you. God be with you, young people, who have perhaps a long, bright, wonderful future in front of you. And if you live in the Bay Area, so many people will tell you, dream big, aim high, be great. But what I want to say is, love God. Follow Jesus. Do the next right thing. Don't live under all of that pressure. That's freedom and joy. God be with you, you old people. For since I came to this church, I have joyfully joined your ranks. And it may be that you are puzzled over your life or disappointed or it doesn't seem to have turned out the way that you wanted to. God be with you as you remember that circumstances and other people are not in charge of your character or the life that lies endlessly before you in the kingdom of God. Outwardly, Paul says, we're wasting away. Everything, uh, reputation, money, status, position, health, can be taken from us. Doesn't really matter. Doesn't really matter. For inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. And um, I, I will tell you, another aspect of this season is just realizing there is no other book like this book. You know, when you walk through the valley of the shadow, there is just no other book to which you can turn. God be with you middle people. For very soon you will be old people. And uh, you don't need to hurry to get there. Don't live exhausted. Don't live tired. Don't live on your own. Don't carry the burden. God be with you, parents. This can be a hard place to raise children. There is so much pressure. I remember a mom praying here one time. Uh, God, forgive me that I want to get my child into Harvard more than I want to get them into heaven. 
And uh, even better than getting your child into heaven is getting heaven into your child. So you give them heaven. There is no joy in the world like the joy of being a parent. There is no pain in the world like a parent's pain. And God knows them both. God chose to be a parent. God chose to have children, so it must surely be worth it. God be with you, staff. We have so many wonderful people on our staff, and most all of you know that, and uh, a lot of them really sacrificed to be here. Most of them could make a lot more money someplace else, or they for sure could live in a bigger, nicer house someplace else, but they love the church. And you on our staff, you have had to carry so many heavy burdens. You have had to answer questions that you had no answers for. You had to solve problems that you could not solve, and I'm so sorry. And I want you to know there are better days ahead. And I know this is true because God makes each day. This is the day that the Lord has made. So we get to rejoice and be glad in this one because this is the day that he inhabits. Because this is the day that he redeems. He will be with you. God be with you, elders. And when it comes to the church, dream big, aim high, be great. But way more than that, love God and follow Jesus, and do the next right thing. God be with you, South City, and Saratoga, and San Jose, and Mountain View, and scrappy San Mateo, and good old Menlo Park. God be with you so that you can be the light of this sorry dark world, and the salt of the earth, and a city set on a hill, and a family from every tribe and tongue and people and nation so that you can love the least of these, so that you can embrace the most excluded, so that you can remember and care for the unseen and unnoticed and the unwanted and the untouchable and the unfed and the unhoused. And, and they'll know they have a family through you. You have been given the greatest cause in the world, and that is the love of God. And when you go, if it's hard, if you face opposition, if you face ridicule, if you face difficulties, if there are forces that threaten or intimidate you, don't you be afraid. Don't you live in fear. Don't you operate out of fear. Because he said, I will go with you. He said, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he will be with us there. So you live with great courage because of him. And above all, God be with you in the person of Jesus. For Melo is, above everything else, a Jesus church. He is why we exist. I said before that I'm in the middle of a story and I have no idea how it's going to end, but that's not quite true. It's not quite true. I know. We know. He will return. He will redeem all things. And ultimately, gang, the only way to heal my broken story or your broken story is to place it in the context of a much larger story that has a cross in the middle and a king at the end. It's a funny thing about the end. The word goodbye is not in the Bible, but there is a little word that often comes when something reaches its end, and it is the word amen. It is such a unique word. It was in Jesus' language, Aramaic, and they couldn't even find a word in Greek, so it was there, and it's the same thing in English. It's, it's this glorious affirmation. It's like yes on steroids. It's all God's promises are yes and amen in Jesus. It's when we affirm something with our whole being, just the way we want it. And it comes at the end, but there's something about it that always looks forward. May it be so. Let it be done. It's the very last word in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with his people. Amen. Because life is not a problem to be solved. It is a story to be lived. And I'm so grateful that for 17 years, my story 
got to be a part of your story. And now, my body will be gone, but my love will remain. And that sound that you hear will be me cheering you on. So now, Menlo Church, I will use your old, still legal name, Menlo Park Presbyterian Church. God be with you. Amen.